um, to Maggie. But once again, thank you for joining us for our May Siegel convening. We loved having an opening activity for fellows to introduce themselves to each other. And we're thrilled to be joined today by Maggie Austin from Empowerment Through Integration um, to hear more about the important work that they do. And Kyle and I had the chance uh, last year to do an activity with ETI at a, at a big conference where they led one for a great group. And we're glad that we got to get into some of that with the introductions that we just had. So thank you, Maggie, for being here. And I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, uh, I realized like halfway through those introductions, I should have stopped sharing my screen. So later when we, I have one more sort of discussion conversation for us, I'll, I'll take it off share screen and we can see each other's face a little better. Um, uh, so thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you all today. Uh, I'm a I'm part time with empowerment through integration um, and a part time law student. So this is a very refreshing break from my paper writing and uh, studying for my constitutional law exam. Um, and like some of other, some of you have shared, uh, I find it very challenging not to talk about my work because I do um, love ETI and I love um, all the great experiences that I've had over the years. Um, including my educational background um, and, and my AmeriCorps years. Um, ETI is uh, really hits the sweet spot for me because I have a vision impairment um, and ETI's work is really around um, shifting our societal narrative around disability from a chari charity based narrative to a value based narrative. Um, and we're really trying to do this work on a global scale. Um, our founder and CEO, Sarah Minkara, um, is a Lebanese American uh, woman who is blind. Um, and she started ETI as a small inclusive summer camp program in Lebanon for kids with disabilities um, and kids without disabilities. Um, and really noticed um, in her experience spending summers um, with family in Lebanon and being a school aged, um, a school, going to school here in America, the disparity between how, um, what kind of empowerment, what kind of um, support she had in the US and, and how the society and culture here felt different than in Lebanon. Um, and a big part of that is, is resource um, and information. Um, so we're working to really help people understand uh, this dynamic between uh, empowering and including people with disabilities and how um, in all the ways that we as individuals um, try to empower and uplift and include, we are part of this shift from um, people feeling like they're um, a charity, feeling like that uh, specifically people with disabilities, but often um, lots of marginalized folks, um, you know, feeling like they are not uh, giving, but they're only receiving. And, and that's sort of the, the foundation of the work that we do. Um, uh, our vision at ETI um, is for all people with disabilities to be valued as individuals and empowered to be their true selves. Um, we believe that society uh, where all community members are given space to reach their full potential and make meaningful contributions is possible when authentic inclusion is embraced. Um, and I hope that our little introductory activity was valuable for you and, and got you thinking a little bit about some ways um, that we create authentic inclusion. Um, and we, we talk about this at ETI from a disability perspective and from a visually impaired and blind perspective, um, but there's lots of um, layers in our world and society that prevent us um, or stop us from being our true selves. And, and hopefully our activity this morning kind of gave you a glimpse of, um, of a way to be included and, be, and participate um, as your full self. Um, uh, in addition, um, we have a few uh, values at ETI. Um, we believe that inclusion for all uh, is value for all, um, that 
the that inclusion doesn't just benefit people with different dif different disabilities, but that uh, everybody really stands to gain by this uh, inclusion. All people should be empowered to celebrate all aspects of their identity and be embraced and valued in return. Um, that all all of who we are is worth accepting and and embracing. Um, Third, people with disabilities are diverse individuals with talents, dreams, and great value, not burden. Um, I touched on this a little bit before. Um, often our sort of um, well-intentioned, as they may be, um, charitable attitudes towards um, people with disabilities, other um, marginalized communities, uh, create an experience for people that they're a burden, that they're um, somebody who needs being taken care of. Um, when, I mean, the truth of the matter is we all need to be taken care of a little bit. We all um, are recipients and contributors of charity, um, uh, of, of charitable acts um, and compassion. Um, and lastly, um, that each of us um has the power to create an authentically oh, i'm blocking my own way here um inclusive world uh so the this reminder for us all um that we all actually hold some of the power um to create inclusion not only for ourselves um but for other people um and so thinking about the ways um that we're interacting with um people in our lives um in a, in a way that is inclusion inclusive um and again not not just like oh i should invite so and so to a party um but how am i really inviting and encouraging people in my life to be who they are um at a really authentic level um so uh really different for eti now um a, a lot of our programming over the years, um, and, and not even a lot, I would say all um, of our programming for the 10 years ETI has been an organization um, has happened in person. Um, we facilitate workshops and run summer camp programming and do trainings uh, live. Um, oh, and our 2019 um, was an incredible year for us. We, we've served almost 250 kids and their families in Lebanon through our life skills and summer camp programming there. Um, the work, the trainings and workshops that we did in the US um, reached about 3,000 participants altogether. Um, it was really incredible. And, and for COVID uh, and the social distancing uh, requirements to hit um, was very jarring uh, for ETI, as I'm sure a lot of you can relate in your work and school lives. Um, and so we're kind of recalibrating as an organization. Um, we're going online. We're really trying to find ways virtually to um, create connection in the midst of this isolation. Um, I mentioned before, you know, this is actually an opportunity where we're all having a shared experience and how, how can we use this shared experience to connect better and more with each other um, at a really authentic level. Um, and, and really, um, build bridges in the, in the mix of all of this. Um, some of the ways we're doing that, we're um, taking what we've learned from our work in Lebanon with life skills training, um, work with um, education organizations in Lebanon, and we're creating uh, e-learning materials so that um, teachers uh, are empowered and uh, have the tools to be um, utilizing inclusive educational methods so that kids with disabilities are able to connect in a virtual education world and thinking a little bit outside the box for that because a lot of our kids especially those with disabilities um, are disproportionately uh, affected right now and they don't always have the technology and, and access um, at home um, and so providing some sort of out-of-the-box thinking and, and options there as well as um, doing online webinars and trainings for uh, people in the community really around the world um, to learn some of the uh, life skills 
um, ideology. And so that all of us are empowered and encouraged to support people with vision impairments within our communities. Um, you know, ETI can no longer send our life skills trainers into kids' houses in Lebanon. And so we're uh, thinking about how to train their parents and their brothers and sisters and their grandparents on how to um, encourage and provide some of those skills and services. Um, and lastly, um, we're, we're doing things like this. We're connecting online with people, sharing our story and our mission um, uh, with really the hopes of building uh, and encouraging people to connect with each other um, and get each other to reflect on uh, inclusion and what that means uh, and, and how that impacts us all. Um, I'll talk at the end briefly about our series that we're launching for that, but i um, excited about that. Um, before I, I move on to um, a discussion for about 10 minutes, um, do folks have questions about ETI and what we're up to and, and what we believe in? I just wanted to say it's really interesting to hear about the shift that you guys are having amid COVID. So I'm glad you're going to have us talk more about that, see how you guys are being responsive and still staying true to your mission. I think that's what a lot of our fellows are navigating of how they continue to do what they were doing in the new times. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> I, full disclosure, you know, we're at a great, it's been like a month and a half of planning for us and, and it's, uh, a lot of trial by error. So, so we're not, uh, you know, I like to say nothing set in stone, but um, this is, this is sort of where we've landed at the moment. Um, and e ETI is um, a really nimble organization. Uh, we're really small. We actually only have six staff members, uh, one of which is in Lebanon um, and, and the rest of us here in the States. And so I think some of uh, our size and the way uh, that we continue to connect with each other allows us to be a little bit nimble and responsive in this. Um, and in other ways, uh, because our team also represents uh, a variety of abilities. Um, my uh, CEO, Sarah, is blind. I have a vision impairment, um, a staff member uh, with cerebral palsy, um, some uh, learning disabilities and mental health challenges. So we, uh, while are nimble, are also like creative and um, are thinking of solutions that are gonna that work for the five or six of us, and in the hopes that that kind of reflects back to the wider um, uh, population. Um, one of uh, one of my uh, learn moments of learning over the years has been around uh, thinking about universal design. Um, I worked for an organization for a while um, that promoted design um, as a human right um, through, um, at, which is a stems from the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities uh, through the United Nations um, and thinking about how uh, Oftentimes people design programming, um, design services, design buildings um, for the norm, for the peak of the bell curve of human experience. Um, but what universal design or human-centered design principles teach us is that actually when you design for um, the edges of the bell curve, for you know, in large part for the people with disabilities and people with differences, um, you actually even better meet the needs of the people at the top of the bell curve. So um, thinking about that as we kind of come off of our uh, in-person work and come online has been fun and challenging for sure. Um, cool, so I wanna jump into, um, a little bit of a conversation just to hear from you folks um, what inclusion means to you. Um, and I, I included some uh, caveat or clarification questions here 
um, maybe what connection you have to the idea of inclusion. Um, are you not sure? Do you have some misconceptions about what inclusion means? Uh, why do you think it's important and, and why um, or how do we all benefit from it? Um, I've included the questions up here on the screen. I'll leave them up for a little while, but as we chat for about 10 minutes, I'll probably um, take it down so that we can see each other better. Um, so and any thoughts from you folks on, on what inclusion means for you? Uh, one definition, well, this isn't really a definition, but one feature of inclusion that I like to think about is that people have a sense of that people are made to feel valued. Um, so I think, you know, it's not just that uh, people are allowed to be someplace, it's that the other folks in that community or space, you know, um, are, 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 making, are making it such that they can be an active participant and that their presence is, is valued and acknowledged. So it's much more active than passive. Um, another thing I think about with inclusion is just also um, intention or being proactive um, off of that too. Like I, I think about an example of in my organization, we were, um, we had a grant to get like a fancy new smart board and stuff. And so we went on this um, trial to like try it out and see what it's like. And there's an option for you to either um, mount it on the wall or get a, a stand that's kind of movable. Um, and so at first we were just like planning to mount it on the wall because we had another whiteboard that was on the wall. Um, but then I remember having the conversation of like, you know, even though we don't have anyone right now in our programs that have identified a need for something that changes height, like we should be proactive about it and try to have that. And so we got like the movable stand where you can move it around the room, but you can also change the height of it. So anyone can, and I mean, for me, I was just thinking about it in the sense of like, I'm short and I can't already reach the whiteboard. So I was just like, how do I get something to like match where I can reach it? Um, but I think, I think of that example, just like trying to be intentional that even though we didn't have like a written or explicit, you know, like defined need from someone that it said, it was just like, how do we um, include those folks ahead of time so that years down the road, like if this, com if this comes up, like we've already taking care of that in a sense and, and not being too retroactive about it or, you know, just being like, well, this, it's already on the mounted or something. So um, that's just what I think about you. Yeah. One thing I think about inclusion that, that pops into my head as well is the idea that um, when you are hiring for, for inclusion specifically, that it's, it shouldn't just be thought of as a way of bettering a social condition that is kind of unjust, but also that it benefits the organization that you're working with, with diverse ideas and diverse understanding of, of, of experiences. And I feel like, the, unfortunately, inclusion starts to hit this, do we fit the, the, the makeup of the country rather than there's an actual organizational benefit to including differing abilities and differing uh, populations. And, and I think I think the misconception is usually to the former, not to the latter. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's one of the, I'm in law school, so <laughs> I think about a lot of the impact of our um, legal uh, practices and our legislation and our policies and, and looking back at the incredible um, fight for the for US legislation around disability um, advocacy and inclusion, um, you know, for those who aren't super familiar, we had um, the passing of the Rehabilitation Act in the 70s, um, which required federal buildings and funding um, to have accessible features. Um, then um, the uh, Education for All um, Children with Disabilities Act was passed. It's called I IDEA now, IDEA. Um, and, and then the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, passed in the 90s. And I think one of the misconceptions around inclusion specifically comes from 
the way that these uh, laws and policies have been misinterpreted in some way where people feel like they have to be inclusive, they have to meet like a quota or, um, and, and not that they want to and that there's a value there. Yeah, this is Lila. I'll just say that that like value add really resonates for me and is something that I try and make sure I check myself on too. And I'm, you know, trying to advocate for more <laughs> inclusive like workplace practices where I work and other things like that. And um, yeah, I just like, it, it's all kind of stems from this assumption that like, you know, white, cisgender, able body, like, et cetera, et cetera, is, um, you know, is not only just the norm, but like the, like better, right? And so how do we like see all that we're losing um, and missing out on from that being like the status quo? So yeah, I appreciate that perspective. And it's just making me think even more about the importance of coming at any sort of like you know, all the tag words, EDI, like inclusion, like work um, with that kind of at the forefront. Take a couple more thoughts before we shift gears. Um, I just think one other thing I think about that, I don't know what's the solution, but I feel like maybe tied to policy and, and resources, I think um, kind of the areas that people, that you want to, to be inclusive, but feel hard to do. And, and I'll give examples like, so I also um, have done some work for the Roxbury Film Festival and it's a very indie film festival. So these are people who are, you know, making films off of whatever they can. Um, and often like the films just don't have the subtitles or the captions um, and on, on our end, like on the festival end, it's something that we can definitely ask for, right? And we've, and we've gotten feedback on that from someone. Um, but then on the other end, it's like the filmmakers themselves don't have the resources often to do it. And so it makes me think too of um, how to basically match like the expectation of inclusion when it comes to things like that, but then matching it with like actual resources and being able to have tools or policies or whatever it might be um, to do that. And I feel like that's sometimes the the other part of the the work where it's like, it just is like, well, it's it like, it just doesn't have it, but then it's like, how do we push past that and then figure out like, what's the, the thing to help eventually it get there. So maybe this year there won't be captions on this film, but maybe in a couple of years from now there could be, but um, yeah, that's just something that comes to mind too. Yeah, I think um, I think some of the the things that I hear in a lot of what you guys are saying is um, this idea that inclusion means like having to make accommodations for people um, and that costing money and resources and energy um, that the idea of inclusion um, does have value for everybody, uh, which is beautiful and I'm like refreshing to hear how echoed that is and what you've shared. Um, and I think ETI um, tries to connect with the idea of inclusion from this space of we, at our core, we all want to be included. We all want to belong. Um, and what does that feel like? What does that look like? Um, how do we do that? How do we help the people that we're serving and talking to and working with um, feel like they belong? Um, how do we help each other um, feel like we belong? Uh, and so that is a, a, a challenge and a, a privilege to, to kind of press into every day and, and is how I've sort of reframed my thinking of inclusion um, as even a person with a disability 
um, that to be included doesn't mean that I have to demand things in large print or braille or audio descriptions on an indie movie. Um, but it means that I could ask the question of, hey, um, how can we make it so I feel a little bit more like I belong, like I can participate fully, like my full self um, is honored and respected. Um, and maybe that's like, I get to sit just using Renee's example of the film festival, like maybe I get to sit in the back row with a friend who's gonna whisper the subtitles to me um, or the um, description to me, uh, or there's some kind of, um, I like to call them hacks, <laughs> low, low budget hacks that really make me feel um, valued and like I belong. So, thanks for sharing everyone. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to wrap up pretty quick here. I want to be respectful of, of everybody's time um, today. Uh, so two things quick that ETI has going on right now um, that you could be involved with. Um, and I can share them with Susie afterwards also to, to share with you folks. Um, next Wednesday, we're hosting our very first um, virtual uh, inclusion programming. Um, uh, we're calling it an inclusion circle, um, a disability and pandemic panel. Um, the five of us uh, US staff members at, at ETI are gonna be sharing um, some of our story um, of living with a disability in this um, particularly unique moment of pandemic and how um, we use our voices uh, in this moment. Um, the second thing ETI has going on is uh, we're doing a fun, uh, totally superfluous activity for the month of May. We're challenging people um, to get active in whatever way they, they can, walk, roll, skate, swim, um, uh, whatever it may be for however many miles you want. Um, we're using it as a little bit of a fundraising campaign. Um, feel free to steal the idea for your own organization, um, but really uh, just as an opportunity to, um, again, connect, stay active uh, in the midst of, of pandemic um, as much as we can. Um, and um, I'll, I'll put this in a message to Susie so she could send it out. Uh, I am a contact for you if you have any questions or want to chat more about inclusion or belonging. Um, and if you're interested in getting involved with ETI in any capacity, you could shoot me an email. Um, my email address is maustin, A-U-S-T-E-N, at etivision.org. Um, and I'm also on, on social media. Uh, and so is my guide dog, Obella. Um, she has an Instagram and she's not very fun right now because life is very boring for a service dog, but um, she, she's, she's still posting some things. Uh, and last, uh, if you wanna join our newsletter, um, you can go ahead online and sign up um, as well as um, shameless plug to follow us on some social media, so. Um, I really appreciate um, you taking an hour to hang out with me today. Um, I enjoyed the study break um, and I'll hang on for a little while if anyone wants to chat or, or has other questions. Uh, but um, major props for everybody who's working from home right now, studying from home, um, you know, check in with yourself, take care of yourself and uh, be well in the midst of all this. Well, Maggie, we just want to thank you so much and thank ETI for your partnership and for being with us today. Fellows, it's wonderful to see you and hear you and have you on the call. And um, we look forward to all staying in touch with each other and with ETI and hope everyone stays well. Um, thank thanks. you so much. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Fun to see you, Renee.